We don't even think about gardening until April or even May in many suburbs, but the unusually mild winter and early spring has many plants blooming already, and that has people wondering, can we get a jump start on our garden season? We've been selling pansies and other flowers for over 20 years, and never this early in the season have we had pansies out. I'm about three weeks ahead of schedule this year. WBZ garden expert Mark Sednaway tells us if you're in the garden this early, proceed with caution. I can't believe it, the forsythia are already in bloom. This plant's about a month ahead of schedule. So what's happening is a lot of the gardeners are thinking, okay, this plant's in bloom now and I should start planting all of my plants. And the simple answer is don't. Don't be tricked just because things are blooming so early in the season that you'll go ahead and start putting out some of those tender plants because undoubtedly we'll get another freeze and some things can't handle it. So pansies it is, and this is nice, but keep in mind, the last frost on average in the suburbs is the first week of May, so don't get too carried away in the gardens just yet. Well, it's my favorite time of the year. It's time to get back in the garden. Our first edition of Gardening with Guttner this season features Mark Sednaway, owner of Pemberton Farms in Cambridge, and he gives us some great tips on how to get started. You know, there's three things to be doing in the garden this time of year, and the first one is raking. I just want to make sure I remove all the debris from last winter. Once I'm done with that, it's time to start doing some pruning. And my rose bush here needs a little pruning, if you give me a hand. Sure. What I normally do is I look for where the dead wood is, okay. and I trim off all the dead wood. So right there's a little spot. Yep. Boom. Here. Okay, and then another one up in here. Yep, get it nice and ready for new growth. Okay, so we've done that. Then we gotta put down some fertilizer, right? You've got a few options here. Right, there's really two ways to go about it. One is to add compost to the soil, or the other one is just to directly apply fertilizer. My beds are at a nice even level, so I usually just apply fertilizer to my garden beds. But if you have some low spots and you wanna build your beds up a little bit, this is when compost really helps. Okay, this is a great start. We've got an organic one and a regular one. Yep, this conventional garden manure, and then this neat new one for us anyway, the lobster compost from Costa Maine. Who doesn't like lobster in I New England? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right, Mark, I think we're pretty well on our way to another great gardening season. Thanks a lot. You're welcome, Todd. So this cold, dreary weather may not have you thinking about gardening, but many local garden centers are now fully stocked with a wide variety of annuals and perennials. WBZ garden expert Mark Sednaway of Pemberton Farms shows us some hot new selections. You know, a great example of something that's just taken off and become really popular are huchera, coral bells. They used to just come in one color, purple, and now they're coming in so many different colors. Look at this variegated mm, purple. It's pretty. And look at the chartreuse color. Nice. It's a nice shade plant, and these colors just really pop in the shade. Not so much for their flowers, but definitely for their foliage. Okay, what else? It's a great annual, million bells, which was popular mm. now for a few years. Now they have double million bells. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Really, really nice. Come over here, I've got a few more examples. You know, we've talked about African daisies a lot. Mm -hmm. And again, expanding on more colors of African daisies. I also mentioned, uh, you mentioned Dicentra. Look at this foliage, yeah. a nice chartreuse foliage. And then of course, one that I've already brought home <laughs> and planted, Valentine, which is the deepest red Dicentra that they've had compared to the old fashioned one that we have here. Also known as the bleeding heart, right? Bleeding hearts, yeah. correct. Yeah. And then lastly, I wanna point out uh, these bearded irises. These are both the new varieties in 2012 mm -hmm. that uh, say that they're gonna bloom again in the fall. Most bearded irises just bloom once, May, wow. June. These are said to bloom a second time, so only time will tell oh, on that. Oh, that's really neat. Uh, and if you'd like some more information on these kind of new and hip plants that are out there and flowers, uh, Mark's provided us with a blog on our website at cbsboston.com, and he's got them all listed there. Anything that blooms twice in a season. Isn't that great? That's great. I love irises in general, but twice is it's a gem. How's your garden going so far? Uh, not good. <laughs> you should see my lawn. It's got a lot of brown patches in it, but hopefully this weather will improve it. Lime. Put the lime down. Lime, like yes. You swear by it. All right. Thanks, Todd. Everybody will be. Okay, it's one of the most popular backyard fruits or veggies. It's the tomato. Nearly every home gardener grows them today with Gardening with Guttner. We're talking to Mark Sednaway. He's owner of Pemberton Farms in Cambridge. And he gives us some great tips on how to uh, help your tomatoes thrive this year. You know, Todd, there are three things you really need to do right now to prepare your gardens for tomatoes. And the first thing is adding a good compost to your soil. I love the old composted car manure. It's been around forever. <laughs> Our grandparents used it. Second thing to make sure is, is you have enough sunlight. Tomatoes need about four to six hours minimum a day of sunlight. And then the last thing is fertilizer. And uh, as you know, I'm a big fan of organic fertilizers. And there's so many on the market to choose from. Espoma makes a tomato tone or garden tone. This one is chickadee doo doo. <laughs> it's chicken manure. And then the last one, Neptune's Harvest, makes a great fish and seaweed fertilizer. All organic, great for your vegetables.
Earth boxes are a really neat way for container gardening of vegetables. It comes with everything you need inside of it. I'm gonna peel this cover back so you can see. What you do is, you fill the reservoir up with water, you put this wick in here that retains the moisture, you fill it with soil, you add the fertilizer in this area here, and then what you do is you cover it so that you're controlling the moisture from here. Dig a hole, one tomato here, one tomato there, You've got a nice supporting system. Oh, yeah. It's a great container for uh, patio tomatoes. So for more great tips like that one there, check out Mark's blog on our website, cbsboston.com, and search Gardening with Gutner. And Lisa, contain yourself. I know this is your favorite time of the year in the garden. That was great advice <laughs> Yeah, it's right a really there. neat apparatus there. I'm going to get one of those. I hope <laughs> the chipmunks don't like them. I hope not, too. <laughs> Todd, thanks. You know, it's ironic that one of the biggest problems homeowner, home gardeners, I should say, face is actually very small in size. They're bugs. But do you know the difference between a good bug and a bad one? Well, this week on Gardening with Gutner, WBZ garden expert Mark Sedenway from Pemberton Farms in Cambridge, he tells us that some bugs can actually be beneficial in your garden. Here's an aphid, total aphid infestation on my wow. yarrow plant. Aphids are always on the newest growth of the plant at the top of the plant, and they basically suck the life out of the plant and stop it from blooming. So what's your remedy? Well, I'm a big organic gardener, and I love home pest uh, remedy. So I bought myself some ladybugs, and what you want to do is uh, release these wherever there's a food source, and there's plenty of aphids around <laughs> here, and they'll go to town. That's a great meal for them. They okay. love that. If you want to go the chemical route, I would recommend either a systemic, which you mix into the soil or a chemical spray. Now one thing you have to remember, aphids are born pregnant, so when you kill them it takes a second, sometimes even a third application. Wow. Uh, if you want to go a safer route, you can get an insecticidal soap, Safer makes one, which is harmless, okay. or you know me Todd, I'm a big <laughs> fan of home remedies. Oh, yeah. Get an empty spray bottle, a little bit of dishwashing soap, mix it together, yeah. very effective. One dollar at the uh, big box store. There you go. That's simple. And you know, most of us have tomato plants, and believe it or not, aphids also love tomato plants, so that's not good. The ladybugs really do work. So if you see them in your garden eating those little guys, those aphids, don't swat them away. They're good. They're very good. Okay. I welcome all ladybugs. <laughs> yes, to my all yard. ladybugs into the garden. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. You know, now is not the time to neglect your garden. Today on Gardening with Gutner, Todd gets some important tips on treating fungus from our garden expert, Mark Sednaway. Good. You need to make sure you, you deadhead your plants and prune them, and sometimes some of them will bloom a second time, so it's really important to do that. Okay, uh, fungus seems to be a big problem this time of year and this season especially. What's right. that about? Well, I mean, roses often get it, so I make sure I treat for that. Another one that's really popular and get, uh, gets fungus is Monarda, which is bee balm. Mm -hmm. And you can see that I have it here. You know, you can purchase an organic spray, okay. but I wanted to point out that you can use baking soda and water. Get the spray bottle. We've used this bottle before for other mm -hmm. things. Some baking soda. It's pretty much the same product as that. Spray all the affected foliage. Okay. Mark, this is a biggie. What's wiping out the impatience this year? Todd, impatience are my favorite annual. I recommend them to everybody for the shade, but look at my impatience yeah. this year. There's a new fungus called the downy mildew, and it's affecting the impatience. Right now, only impatience, and look what it's done to them. Yeah, it's all scraggly. It's wiped them mm. down to nothing. Unfortunately, the only thing you can do right now is to completely remove them, put them in a plastic bag, and throw them out. You don't want the spores from the mildew to spread in for next season. Outdoor gardening season's coming to a close, but you can still grow plants inside your home. In today's Gardening with Gutner, WBZ gardening expert Mark Sednaway from Pemberton Farms gives Todd some tips on starting a terrarium. As we get deeper and deeper into autumn and the outdoor gardening season is wrapping up, we're turning our attention indoors to a fun, trendy new project called terrariums. You should be able to get everything you need to build a nice terrarium at your local garden center or hardware store. So once you've picked out your container to build a terrarium in, you need to add a layer of drainage. And the first thing you add is a layer of gravel on the bottom of the container. You know, the second layer of drainage you should put is charcoal. L drainage is very important for a terrarium, and the rocks and the charcoal make a nice barrier at the bottom. Okay, and then the last step? The last step is your, your potting soil. I mean, plants do need to grow in soil, even okay. in a terrarium, so you want to use a nice sterile soil. Definitely get a new bag of potting soil and fill up your terrarium. Okay. And then from there we pick the plants. Yeah, the fun part is picking the plants, and I 
got some plants here for you to choose from. These are all foliage plants. They're gonna want moisture and humidity. And then what you do after you've planted them in soil is sometimes you put a top dressing of stone back on them again okay. to make them look nice and pretty. We Just could do decorative. that around. Yeah. And there you go. There's a terrarium and it's a great indoor project for the family. And uh, what about caring for it? Uh, moisture and just make sure you don't overwater them. One of the biggest problems is people overwater terrariums. Okay, and a little spray bottle sometimes works well? Misting works great. I mean, again, there's no drainage here, so you have to be careful not to let them sit in water. Okay. And there's the finished product. Beautiful. For more on terrariums, Mark's got a great blog on our website at cvsboston.com. Okay, the gardening season, it may be winding down, but there's still at least one more important task you need to do. It's plant your fall bulbs. This week on Gardening with Guttner, I spoke with WBZ garden expert Mark Sednaway on some of the more popular bulbs to get in the ground. Mark, the two most common, obviously the tulip and the daffodil, but you actually prefer one over the other? I do. I'm really starting to fall in love more and more with daffodils every year. Tulips are great. They come in a multitude of colors, and you've had them for years and years. But daffodils are my favorite for a couple of reasons, and I think the most important is that squirrels won't go after <laughs> my daffodils. Every year I plant tulips, and I can't tell you that uh, they Next bite the heads. spring, they're not there. They're not there. <laughs> daffodils, they tend to leave alone. And also what's really nice about them is that they multiply a lot better than tulips. Aside from the tulip and daffodil, you have some personal favorites that you want to share with us. I do. Allium. If you look at the size of this flower, it's literally the size of almost a person's head. Mm. It's a great bloomer in, in early to mid-May. I have them all over my landscape. And what else? There, you know, there's, there's this blue flower that always comes up every spring. So it's called grape hyacinth, or the Latin name is Muscari, and it is. It's extremely popular. Everyone comes in the springtime when flowers are just starting to come up and says, what is that little <laughs> blue flower growing in my garden? This is it, That's folks. It. If you want it, you need to buy it now in the fall, plant it by the end of October, and next spring you'll have that beautiful blue flower everywhere too. Uh, so if you'd like to know more about the bulbs, Mark's got a great blog on our website at cbsboston.com. And when you get there, search Gardening with Guttner. And you love those, right? You just picked two yeah. of my favorite. I'm so happy. But Good. question, we don't have to get those in the ground by Saturday. No, not at all. Okay. Uh, you know, we'll have a frost Saturday morning, but the ground itself won't freeze. Okay. You have until it freezes before you need to get them in the ground. Good to know. That'll be on the to-do list for sure. <laughs> all right, yes. Todd, thanks. Speaking of timing, the weather outside, I hope you got a chance to get outside. This felt more like a spring, even summer day. Well, that's all the more reason for Todd Gutner to be outside this evening at Pemberton Farms in Cambridge, where, Todd, we know the trees are all friendly and grounded. <laughs> <laughs> they are. This is a great place here. Mass Ave, Pemberton Farms in Cambridge. Very festive right now. Of course, there are wreaths and there's poinsettia and Christmas cactuses. They've got it all. But the real attraction here at Pemberton Farms are the Christmas trees. Jonathan and Lisa, here is my dilemma. This is Frosty right here. Fraser or Balsam? I don't know. Unfortunately, Frosty doesn't speak. But we do have the owner of Pemberton Farms, Mark Sedway, also WBZ garden expert, to do a little talking for us. Mark, how do we pick out the perfect Christmas tree? Well, I mean, trees are just beautiful this year. It's one of our best crops ever. If you're shopping for a tree, you want to look for a nice shape, nice full bushy tree. And then the easiest thing to do, Todd, is grab a bunch of the needles and pull them out. Nothing in your hand, that's a pretty healthy tree. Clearly, you have some healthy trees. All right, there are many different Christmas trees that you can get. There are two biggies, though. Yeah, I mean, balsams are the trees that we've had since we were little kids, and in the last few years, Frasers have increased popularity, and they're, they're also really, really nice. Balsams are the ones that smell great, the ones that fill up your whole house with fumes. Uh, Frasers smell great, but they really hold their needles really well, one of the key benefits to them. Okay, let's get to cutting the base of the trunk, because you do it here when someone buys the tree, but some folks say they actually would prefer to wait until they get home? Right. I mean, most places you go and buy your tree, they should offer to cut it for you. We usually ask people, are you planning on putting it in water soon? It, you want your tree in water within one or two hours after cutting it. So if you're not going to put it up right away, then cut it when you get home or put it in a bucket of water on the porch. Mark, that's great. I think we're all ready to get the perfect Christmas tree. Happy holidays to you. Good luck this holiday. Mark, how do we keep the perfect tree, though, fresh in the house longest? Keep it full of water first and foremost. When you first bring home the tree, you got to fill it up every couple days. I brought mine home Friday. I've already filled it up twice. And then the second thing, Todd, you know, you can purchase this stuff, this tree preservative, but I'm a little old-fashioned home remedy <laughs> guy, like my grandparents and parents used to use. A little bit of Sprite, a couple aspirin tablets in the bottom of the tree. Pour a little Sprite in and you're good to go. It works just as well. And if it has a headache, it's going to be fine too. Should be great. 